Hi and welcome. My name is Karen McAllister. I'm the Assistant Director for Student Recruitment for the College of Engineering at the University of Texas at Arlington and welcome back to another Ask an Ambassador. Uh, today we are actually going to be focusing on undergraduate research and senior design projects. So it's a pretty loaded uh, conversation topic. So I'll go ahead and let our uh, two presenters with me today go ahead and introduce themselves. Hi everyone, my name is Ishra. I'm currently a master's student in the biomedical engineering department. Hello everyone, my name is uh, Naum Torres. I am a UTI alumni and I am a uh, guidance navigation and control engineer at Lockheed Martin in MFC, Grand Prairie. Awesome, and welcome to you both. So we are talking research. Um, I would say first and foremost, I'm sure a lot of individuals, students, even prospective students, I don't know, even myself, kind of want to know how do you get involved in research? Like, how do you look out for projects? How do you find these projects? If I'm just looking for undergraduate research to begin with, where do I start? Um, so for me personally, um, whenever I took a class, I would always see what my professor's area of research was. And, um, you know, and throughout the class, I would ask them like questions about it and what they did. And if it really appealed to me, um, I would like for one class, it really appealed to because he did like cancer biology research. And so I uh, emailed him and I'm, I said, hey, you know, um, I'm really interested in the research you do. I really like it. I'm passionate about it. Would you have um, time to talk about it? And so I set an appointment up with him and, um, you know, we talked and he was just like, yeah, this is what I do. This is the focus of my lab. And so at the end of our conversation, I was like, well, do you think you would have um, room to have a undergrad as a, you know, come work in your lab? And he's like, yeah, of course. And um, that's a lot of the uh, ways that me and my friends got our research positions. A lot of the professors at UTA are super duper, um, you know, receptive to undergrads and they will give you a chance to work in their lab. You just have to show like, you know, that you're self-motivated and you have the enthusiasm for it. Yeah, and we also have the, the uh, College of Engineering page and so you can find uh, what research is going on within the department. So if you know if you're not too comfortable talking in person to the professor or if he doesn't introduce, you know, the type of research that he's doing during class, then you, you can also search by the, uh, the web page that we have in engineering. Awesome. So my question to you both is, OK, maybe I found the right opportunity. What kind of skills should I bring to the table or what kind of skills should I be expected to maybe already have in place and maybe what skills could I learn? And I know that can be very different based upon the research topic, obviously, but broadly speaking, what kind of skills should I already have in place to take on a research project? So for the research lab that I worked in, they used a lot of cells and um, since it was a cancer biology um, lab, they used a lot of cells and a lot of culturing and stuff like that. And so knowing how to culture cells, knowing how to like, you know, change over like the medium and things like that and being familiar with making solutions to immerse the cells and stuff. And I thought that um, going into it, those were what I knew and I did utilize a lot of that. But um, the PhD student that I worked under showed me like a lot more. And so I guess the perspective I have is like go in with the skills you have, but like um, just know that, you know, those skills are going to expand once you start working. And because the PhD student I work with was super, super nice. And um, he showed me everything like from the beginning. Out. He's like, hey, um, if, uh, you know, in the real world, in, if you work in industry, you'll need to do this, this. And so I had like a great mentor who helped me learn a lot of the aspects that helped me become like su successful in the lab. Yeah, and talking about mentorship. Um, so when I was doing my PhD studies, I actually mentored several students uh, that were undergraduates and my expectation from them was just willingness to learn. And so I will teach them how things that they they learn in class are applied in actual research to produce something that is actually useful uh, for everyone. And so uh, it's just, you know, be willing to work extra hours, willing to learn, and from there you will learn the skills that you need for that specific project that you're working on. So it's not necessarily uh, a, oh, well, you know, I'm just a freshman. I cannot contribute anything because I don't have any knowledge. And so that's 
that's not true. Uh, anyone can contribute to anything. Uh, you just need to be passionate about it. So if you don't like what you're working on, then don't work on it. Uh, find something else. And so find something that interests you and just start working on it and you will learn different skills as you as you grow within that team that you're working with. Awesome. So you just kind of touched on the my next question there. So is there a certain like classification or a certain number of credit hours I should have completed before I look at a research project? Basically, I'm asking, can a freshman or a sophomore take on a research project? I think, um, yeah, definitely if they're, you know, motivated enough and they're passionate about the topic that they want to research. And um, like I said, like a lot of the professors, if you just show that you want to, you know, be there, they'll definitely take a chance on you and they'll give you that opportunity to work in their lab. Um, and then at UTA, we just have such a high level of research. There's always something in the lab that needs to be done. So I think the professors would actually appreciate, you know, having the extra help. Right. And in some instances, uh, my last mentee that I had, he was actually a freshman. And after one semester of volunteer work that he did in, in the lab in which what I was working with, uh, he actually ended up getting a paid internship through the lab. And after that, he was hired by UT Research Institute. So it, it depends on how, how good you perform and then opportunities would expand from there. So don't be afraid to just, you know, just start working, uh, you know, and actually the best time to start on it is when you're freshman, because as you grow, the classes are more difficult. You have less time and while you're a freshman, you have more time. Classes are not as complicated and less homework and so on. And so it'll be easier for you to start transitioning into a research and studies kind of lifestyle. Absolutely. So and this is for both of y'all. Why is it important for a student to participate in research while they're in their undergraduate career? Um, for me personally, um, I wanted to know how to be able to apply what I learned in the classroom to the outside world. Kind of like in the classroom, you learn to talk the talk, but in the research lab, you learn to walk the walk, if that makes sense. And also, um, I knew that in the future, I was going to go to medical school and I wanted to pursue research in medical school as well um, and so that was a big thing for me and I knew like how important research was I've seen like a lot of my um, upper level friends who have done it and it's just I really like it I like you know sitting in the lab I like working with the cells like it's something that I really enjoy I like being given a problem and trying to find like a solution for it and um, also, like with cancer biology, cancer is very, very prevalent in the US. And so I think the more research we do on it, the better. So that hopefully, like, you know, one day in my lifetime, we come close to a cure. So. Yeah, and I, I think it actually goes both ways. Uh, so if you join a research uh, project, uh, you will learn the things, how things are applied from class into actual uh, practice, but also it will help you learn the uh, the topic more in depth and so you will actually perform better in class so i noticed that uh, the the students that i will mentor will not only perform better in in class but also in research so they there's a uh, two-way uh, benefit to that that's awesome um, so my next question for y'all is really going to be more in terms of y'all's experience. Um, if you participated in any research in your undergraduate, did you notice any differences in the way research was conducted between your undergraduate and graduate career and kind of what those maybe differences look like for a student? Yeah, so uh, the transition between undergrad to grad, there's definitely um, more responsibility involved. Uh, the professor, once you're at that graduate level, you know, gives you more responsibility and um, they might, you know, let you even have your own project, which you design from the ground up. And um, yeah, there's just uh, a little bit more expectations from you. Or that's how I felt in a way. Right. It depends on the individual, I think. Um, so when I was an undergraduate, I through my senior design, I was recruited into a research team. 
And so the professor said, hey, I like how you work. Uh, would you be interested in doing research for me in industrial engineering? Unfortunately, that was industrial and I was so focused into electrical engineering, I kind of just said, that's not my area of interest, but you know, thank you for the offer. Um, but in when, when I was a PhD student, um, I, I kind of recruited the, the undergrads and depending on how they perform, they were given more responsibility. So in part of the senior design uh, of a team of students, I kind of just let them take over the micro robotics club. And so they were leaders of the club instead of me. And so they kind of replaced me there and they joined the research team after that, after they graduated. And from there, people got their masters. Some others, you know, went to different schools for PhD and so on. So it depends on how well you perform, how well you're, or not how well, but how dedicated you are into the project that you're working on. And just, it just grows from there. All right, so my question to y'all is very much in terms of what do you wish you had known or what advice would you give to somebody looking at undergraduate research? So what is that one piece of information that you're like, if I had known this, this would have been the game changer for me? Huh, that's a... I wish I was better at, I wish I would have started learning um, solid works at like that freshman level instead of like you know in the upper class like junior senior level because it really uh makes a difference because solid works is very well used in um a lot of the modeling that we do and like it's like you can get a certification in it and having that certification can really make a difference on your resume so like knowing solid works and like knowing how to code i think were two things that i wish i would have known really well so. Yes, for me, I wish I had gotten involved with research earlier on rather than just after I graduated. Um, the only involvement that I had with research as an undergrad was my senior design and that was only, you know, after we were done. Um, and, and, and that's one of the main reasons why I started mentoring students and getting them involved because I thought that was a very um, important thing that I missed while I was an undergrad. Awesome. So you talked about senior design and that's my next topic. Let's talk senior design. What is senior design and what can a student expect to potentially gain from that experience? So um, with every engineering degree at UT Arlington at the end of in the senior year, like at the very end, um, you take a senior design class for me when I was in electrical engineering, it spanned two semesters. The first one was senior design one, the second semester was senior design two. And so the first semester we were assigned our teams and we were assigned what we were like our project. And we spent that whole semester, you know, um, working on parts list, working on like the concept behind our um, project and essentially getting ready for the spring in which we were going to actually build it. And then in the spring semester during se uh, senior design two, we actually built um, our project and uh, troubleshot it and um, yeah and then at the end we presented it to our professor or to our client. Yeah so it was similar for me I, I graduated from electrical engineering and uh, one of the advice that I, I received from other senior members were to not have a full schedule for senior design so that I can focus on the project and so that's what I did I think I only had like three classes instead of four and so that kind of helped me to focus more on the senior design and spend more time on it and be successful with it. Absolutely, that's some great advice. That way it gives you time to focus in on it. So my next question for you both would be more along the lines of what was one of the or some of the challenges you faced during your senior design project? So when we were initially designing it, um, our designs were pretty good. Um, we thought first semester we worked pretty well um, and we thought, hey, you know, we got this, but that second semester, just because something works in theory does not mean it may work in the lab. And so we had to troubleshoot a lot and, you know, we had to change out some resistors and we had to do a lot of, you know, uh, 
different troubleshooting methods because um, the big problem we have is like only one part of our device would work and it would record like the measurements and then the other part wouldn't work. And so just getting the um, two to talk via uh, Bluetooth and using the modules for that, that was just the difficult part for um, our group. Yeah, for me, it was um, taking over somebody else's work and, and teamwork. So in my senior design was an unmanned uh, ground vehicle, and so it was a developmental uh, project. So it was not finished in one you know, senior design project. And so it was a compilation of like the last three years. And so I had to learn what everybody had done in the past so that I can take over and continue to uh, uh, to develop the, the system. And so it was very difficult to read everyone's different uh, lines of code and, you know, and, you know, comments and what they meant and so on. So that took a long time and I actually worked on learning everything during the uh, the Christmas break. So so that when I started the, the actual semester, then I would know exactly what, you know, what to do after that. And, and the second the second challenge that we had was teamwork. So this was a very large um, team. So we had different departments. I was in, in the uh, electrical engineering control systems team, and then we had mechanical and we had software and it was basically a real project in which, you know, uh, it was my first time experiencing. And so it was very difficult to, uh, for me to learn how how to work with others with different disciplines and and getting them to finish their work that I needed so that I can start mine. And so it was we uh, we kind of worked together and actually when the mechanical team was not done, we actually did mechanical work for them so that we can get everything that we needed for the electrical team uh, to uh, to start doing the control systems. So it was a very good experience with with teamwork with different disciplines for me. Absolutely. So my question for both of y'all is, do you get to choose or have any opinion in who you work with on your senior design project or is it all pre-selected for you? Um, so for uh, my senior design class, we did like a survey and it was like our schedules, our interest, our skill set, like our strengths, our weaknesses, um, things like that. And so yeah, uh, we did that survey and whoever scored a like were in put into the, I think we had a six different teams overall. And yeah, we were put into one of the teams based on the results of our survey. And so um, luckily one of the friends, uh, one of my partners was someone I was friends with, but the other two uh, guys I didn't really know, but um, they were really, really nice and we worked well together, so. Yeah, for me it was, um partially a choice so we had to um, pick a subject that we wanted to work on and from there uh, it was we were just placed into the different teams so it was i didn't have a survey or anything that you said what do you want to work on and i said electrical engineering control systems so then we had several projects on that and so they just put us in different teams i think it varies by the professor that's actually teaching the the senior design project uh, that's all good to know so you kind of know that you may or may not have some sort of sway in that conversation for senior design so you have both kind of talked about it in different ways and how that experience kind of you know helped you personally what advice do you give to anyone who is about to start their senior project or is going to be starting like let's say in the next like semester maybe two semesters that they're about to start that process what can they do now to help them prepare more and to feel successful in that project? Um, for me personally, uh, our project was based a lot on circuits, so I would have reviewed like all the notes I took in um, Dr. Howard Russell's class. I would have gone through everything and made sure I knew it better and I would knew how to apply it because that's when it came to down to everything. Um, our circuit design was just very poor. And um, sometimes like some of our components we put in there, in theory it made sense, but in practicality it didn't. So I would have reviewed my circuit topics for sure because it would have saved me a lot of time and a lot of hassle um, with, you know, designing the circuit and doing and doing all that. And also um, I would recommend knowing how to make your own PCB board because that was really, really important and that was something we had to do 
And um, for the EE, there's like a makerspace that we have and there's a really, really, really nice lab assistant named Todd. And he is super great. And he has put together, like on the EE website, he's put together, um, I think there's two or three like tutorial videos on how to make your PCB board and what program to use and things like that. And so from my point of view, personally, those two things would have helped me out a lot. So, um, but I would recommend the PCB board because I think every project that we had, they had a PCB design. And so just making that board and getting it done is like a really, really big aspect of it. And also um, because of what's going on in the world with COVID, getting it, the PCB board done early and getting it like, you know, manufactured and sent back to you is like super duper important. So when I've talked with my undergrad friends, that's what I've kind of told them. I'll say try to get familiar with the project that you're going to work on and know if and try to find out if it's a uh, if it's in a different development devel developmental stage and and who worked in the previous uh, developments and so uh, we have a lot of international students that work on different projects and so before they leave to back to uh, you know their home country or they get a new job or whatever the reason is before they leave the university try to have a conversation with them on what they did and get some sort of explanation for their work and that way it'll be easier for you to understand what's been done and how you can take over the the project if it's a one of those projects that you take over and if it's a brand new project try to uh, to get in touch with the professors that's sponsoring the project and get as much information as you need to so that you can uh, plan before you even start. Um, and that way, if if there's no leadership in your team, you can take over that leadership position and, and keep the team moving. Um, um, yeah, so don't wait for someone to to take, you know, the leadership position. If there's no position, take, you know, take that lead and, and start doing, you know, the work that, that you need to. That way you don't, you know, you don't waste too much time on who's going to, you know, be responsible for you know, ensuring that this is done, who's going to be responsible for that. Before you even start, you should already know everyone's responsibility in the team. Absolutely. It, in my experience, just even in any project, work assignment, anything, setting that groundwork, getting all those expectations right. out there does help everything. Absolutely. That's perfect advice. That's perfect advice to carry for life. <laughs> So my next question for you both is with us being in this virtual environment, obviously COVID has kind of affected um, research, senior design projects. Can you all walk me through what that's looking like right now and what could a student expect if they were potentially going to be more virtual for this experience? So yeah, I'm good friends with one of the students who's a senior in the biomedical engineering department and from what I've seen with her and the experience. So she and her roommates meet up uh, on Microsoft Teams um, daily. I think they meet up from like four to six and then they discuss like their project and stuff and everybody like presents like, okay, well, this is my part. This is what I've worked on this week. And then later in the week, I think they have, what, from what she told me, they have designated times when they can go to the lab and actually work because um, I personally, since I didn't do my senior design in biomedical, I don't, know if they have a room or not but for I know for EEs we had like a specific senior design room that was designated for us that had like lockers with like um, tools and things that we could use and that we could also put our parts and stuff in so I think they have something similar and so they go to their lab and um, yeah I think they go two times a week and their times are like an evening time and they work on their project and they kind of you know put together like what everybody's done they piece together you know this is how this has helped the project and they, then they go from there. And then I think every Friday night she told me they make plans for the next week and what they're going to do and what their goals and outcomes are. So. Yes, for me, even at work, uh, I think it has helped us to be more productive. So uh, we're trying to work from home as much as we can, but you know, we have things that we have to test in the lab. And so when we go in the lab, we're focused on what we're going to do. And it, so we just get it done. We go and get it done. And it, it, the COVID situation has actually made us more productive. So because 
we cannot be around each other so long, right? So then we go there, we do it efficiently, and then we move out and do each other's work elsewhere. So um, another benefit of you know of the situation that we're in with COVID is that we actually now talk to other people that are not necessarily here in our plant. So we have different locations, you know, in the U.S. and even around the world. I haven't communicated with anyone around the world, but I know I've been communicating a lot with other uh, facilities uh, to get something done. So it, something that I didn't do before COVID. And so now everybody is more available um, and we get things, you know, moving regardless of the situation. Absolutely. I, I will say um, I do feel that kind of efficiency that's in place now for many people. Um, so I think that is awesome. And it's good to hear that we still have research continuing and that we are doing everything possible to make sure that that's still an option for many individuals. And it's great to hear about how it's even working in uh, industry standards. So I will say our next question is going to be, all right, so innovation day. What is it? What is this? I've heard about it. How would we explain what is Innovation Day for our students? Innovation Day is held every spring and it's a basically it's a day where students can showcase their senior designs and um, other research projects that they've been working on. Um, in order to do this, they have to submit like a form and um, you know, put who their um, supervising professor is and everything. And then, yeah, it usually takes place in the Bluebell Ballroom, which is a super big room. And we have the big, um, like, wooden uh, boards and, like, the big posters go up. And then for the senior design categories, there's first, second, and third place. And then there's honorable mention. And then for the individual research, I believe there's first and second place. And um, they get prizes. And so, yeah, it's a great way to showcase the, of the, um, the research that you've been doing, that you've been working so hard on. And it's a, also like, you know, it's a, another good way to network and kind of meet individuals across the board and kind of see all the different things that, you know, engineers and the other disciplines are working on, as well as other students at UT Arlington. Yeah, I think you mentioned everything about the Innovation Day, but uh, one of the important things that I liked about that place is networking and you get to see what other people are, are doing and that's how you can get involved also. Um, I think we lost the slides there. All right, so I'm actually going to go ahead and pull up a website. So hang tight, y'all. Um, could y'all maybe walk me through a little bit more on Innovation Day of what it looks like maybe virtually since I know um, that's going to be the expectation. So um, I can see a lot of people uh, posting up like, you know, submitting their PowerPoint and everything so that it's available to the public and then doing something similar to what we're doing where, you know, someone shares the screen and they walk through their PowerPoint or they walk through their poster with you and describe like the areas of their research and what the overall goal is and how they went about designing what they the research that they're currently presenting. Yeah, I'm not sure how it's going to take place. Uh, um, Karen, are you trying to share your screen? I'm not seeing it. It's blocking me, unfortunately. OK, let me see if I can pull it up and share mine. Awesome, because we do actually have some of the projects from the 2020 round available on the website, so we can actually take a look at those. So we can kind of get an idea of what these look like. And so just like Ishrat was mentioning of the projects having a first, second and third place, you'll see that on the website here. Um, are there any in particular that either one of y'all would like for us to click on to take a look at and see kind of what students maybe are producing? That lawnmower looks super cool. I wish I had one. <laughs> <laughs> I'll play the video for just a second.
Hello and welcome to our virtual innovation day presentation. We are the autonomous lawnmower team with Fu, Ulysses, Alex, Jerry, and Darren. If you take a look at our executive summary, you will see that our main problem is the amount of time it takes to mow large pieces of land. For our sponsor, we calculated that it takes eight hours in the sun to mow the lawn. Our goal for this project is to create a fully autonomous electric lawnmower that will mow the lawn with little to no human input. Moving on to our background, we have a 25 acre farm to mow. Robotic lawnmowers already exist, but they are much too small. We have a 52 inch zero turn electric lawnmower. It must be remotely controlled via Wi-Fi, autonomous, and it must be safe. For our conceptual design phase, our system is composed of four main systems. Control system, which uses user input over Wi-Fi uh, to control the mower, which is checked with our safety system. A VR display system, which uses a 360 degree camera on the mower to display 360 degree live view to our VR headset, which also includes a heads up display with warnings on it. Our safety system, which uses sensors around the mower like LiDAR and GPS to determine if there's any safety issues like being out of bounds or about to run into something. Our autonomous mowing system, which uses all other systems to follow a GPS coordinate map, which is set beforehand for our detail. All right, so we're going to go ahead and navigate back on over to our landing page here. Is there another one that y'all would like us to click on and take a look at to see what research is looking like virtually? Yeah, the um, temperature and pressure perception glove for nurse substitution in the hand looks interesting. Awesome, let's take a look at this one and see how this is looking like virtually. Hello, my name is Jasmine Diego and I'm the team leader for this project. My teammates are Demma Alzari, Dion Mendina, and Martin Ortega. We conducted this research under the supervision and support of Dr. Young T. Kim. Our research is creating a temperature and pressure perception glove for the nerve substitution in the hand. The inspiration for this project was to address the everyday obstacles that people afflicted with peripheral neuropathy face. This condition leaves the patient without the proper tactile sensations, and therefore we aim to create a glove that would replace these sensations, specifically pressure and temperature. Additionally, we wanted to create a feedback loop to the user instead of just gathering information for analysis. In figures one and two on the screen, you can see the schematics for the outside layer or armor part of the glove. This is intended to protect the user as well as the sensing technologies within the design. This armor would be made out of either ABS or NinjaFlex, a decision that would have been made after testing. The other components used are the Flexi Force sensors and the digital thermal file sensor, of which the specifications are listed in the experimental section as seen. Lastly, we would be building the circuit off an Arduino unit and breadboard which would be placed on a risk component along with batteries. The next step was to combine all the individual components and eventually move to a more compact and portable design. Listed in this next section is our experimental testing plans. This briefly details four different procedures, testing the pressure sensor when doing different actions, testing the temperature sensors for accuracy, testing the durability and options of the two 3D printed materials, and lastly, testing the battery life over a long-term period. All right, and we're gonna jump back to that landing page one more time and pick out one more project to just kind of take a look to see what's going with it. And yes, for the 2021 uh, Innovation Day, we will be looking at this virtual component again. Uh, 
very similar of students submitting videos. So this is a good insight to see if you're going to be submitting something for consideration or just wanting to know what research is out there. So what last one do you all want to take a look at real fast? Microfluidics, the second place on a chip microfluidics device for part. Yeah, that one. Sounds good. Uh -oh. They must have changed the settings after this was updated. Sorry. Is there another, another one? one? Hello, oh, we're group NBETR. Our team has Barsha, Tristan, Matensa, and I, Iris. Um, our project is on creating a hypertrophic heart model for hypertrophic heart patients. Um, as we all know, a physical model can help surgeons to give uh, a better treatment, a better visual and anatomical understanding of the heart. So we've got about 1,100 CT scan image from our mentor, and we were able to analyze those images using a software called ScanIP. And we were able to create um, a 3D virtual 3D heart model. Um, our project has the following main parts. Uh, first, we were able to do uh, the um, image acquisition and then segmentation, where the majority of the work has been done, and then virtual 3D model creation. And we were able to come to this far. And then after that, it's going to be printing and then testing for improvement. All right, so these projects, along with many others, are actually available on the website, so you can actually check those out at any time and get a little bit of an idea. There's also including uh, the abstracts and the participants, so you can kind of get an idea to see what's been talked about in the past, what research has gone on, and get maybe some ideas for, you know, what to expect for Innovation Day 2021. Um, Innovation Day 2021 is actually scheduled for uh, April 19th of 2021. <laughs> so get excited. It's going to be coming up. So my last questions for you both are going to be more along the lines of some of the challenges in working with a team on any of these projects or any research project. Um, so we kind of touched on how it looks virtually. Uh, let's talk about maybe some of the dynamics of teams. Um, what kind of struggles in terms of personalities maybe happen or how do you overcome any conflicting ideas when you're talking in these research projects or even in your senior design project? How can you overcome those? You're muted, Isra. I had a really good uh, senior design group. Um, they were really, really awesome. Um, we communicated really well. That's one of the first things we um, kind of um, right off the bat that we did we gave everyone like hey this is the time i'm available um these are the other classes that i'm taking um we told each other if we had a job outside of work or not like uh one gentleman he actually had a family and so sometimes he would bring his kids and so we just we communicated very heavily and we made like a google uh, sheets with expectations for everyone and we kind of um rated each other each week and said hey you know you did awesome or hey you kind of you know failed to hit the curve today can you you know work on it a little bit and do better like you know next week and so i think the communication was definitely key and w once we got a flow going like it was really really good and uh we would meet up every um i think every monday and wednesday night because that's when most of us all of us that were actually free and we would spend a lot of time in the senior design lab and just work on get all all our like tasks for the week completed um and yeah we just we actually we worked really well together i was really lucky to have a really good group um one of my friends unfortunately did not have a good group and i think one of the um one of her team members actually withdrew from the class a month before school was supposed to um school was supposed to be done for the semester and so they had three members and then they ended up being two members and they actually they did really good on their senior design project and they carried it out and they finished it really well but um yeah i was just very very lucky um to have such a great group 
I know a lot of my friends had some horror stories, so. Yeah, for me, it was um, interpersonal skills. Uh, so I, w I had just gotten out of the military and I am a mission oriented person. And we had some people that were people oriented person. They don't care so much about the mission. They just want to be happy with others and so on. But I was more into the mission accomplishment. And so it, we had issues with, oh, you're acting too militarish over here. You know, you need to calm down and, you know, things like that. But it all, you know, it, it, it just got fixed by talking to each other, you know, learning where we're coming from and, and how we're used to operate and so on. And I was also the oldest one uh, of the group. So I, you know, <clears throat> instead of, you know, um, just telling somebody to do their work, I actually inspired them to do it rather than just telling them to do it. And so when we had people that didn't really want to do what they were doing or they ended up in the team because somebody put them in the team and it was not their project of choice, then they ended up not doing so much for the team. And so that's when I had to come in and inspire them to actually do the work rather than just, you know, complain about them and, and make the situation even worse. And so that, that was my approach as to fix that, that part of the, you know, the team uh, problems that we had. And eventually we ended up being very close friends after, you know, the, the project was done. We went to a competition and we actually got to, you know, work overnight, you know, without sleep, without eating and, and so on. And, and it was freezing temperatures. So we, we got to, uh, uh, to get to know each other a little bit better than just, you know, um, rather than just complain about each other and I don't like you or you don't like me and so on. So you just got to talk to each other, um, get to know the person that's working on your team. And, and I think that's best, you know, for, for the long run. Awesome. So my wrap up question for you both is we've talked a lot about research, talked a little bit about what it's looking like currently in our COVID-19 environment. We talked about innovation day, talked about senior design. We talked about a lot of things today. Overall, what advice would you give to anyone or any last thoughts that you would give to any student who is starting on that research endeavor? I would I'll say. say Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Ladies oh, oh. first. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I would say definitely do it. It has um, definitely helped me a lot in terms of my critical thinking skills, interpersonal skills, and um, you know just like the way I see things. And um, it like um, Dr. Torres was saying, it has definitely made me a better student as well because a lot of the things that I learned in the lab, I can apply when we like in biomedical engineering now. A lot of the things that we do, we do a lot of projects. And like, you know, making an actual feasible design for it, I think I'm capable of it because of the experiences I've had in lab. And, you know, um, even if you don't think your future goal is to be a researcher, it's just still do it, just to have that experience so you can kind of get a taste of the field you're going into because it just, I don't know, to, to me, it just, it made a really big difference in my, like, from when I was a freshman because I was very introverted to now to where I can give these presentations. And I think getting involved in research has really helped with that. And I think like research has helped kind of shape like my, what my future career goals, I want them to be. And it's just had a very big impact. So I think if it has such a big impact on me, it can have like, even if you don't think it's for you, it can even have a small impact on you, so. Yeah, one of the, one of the things that I noticed as, as I taught different classes at UTA is, uh, students are very uh, eager to go and to jump into the actual practical application of what they're learning and so they uh, most of the time they skip the reading from the books and so uh, unfortunately engineering is not it's not a, a discipline that you can skip the reading so reading is not optional and i would say learn how to learn because even after you graduate, you still have to learn as technology evolves, you have to learn new pieces of technology, how to implement and how to apply it in, in your actual job. And so for me, learning has not stopped and I don't foresee that it will eventually stop, you know. So I, I keep reading books, uh, technical books, not technical books. Uh, so reading is not optional and 
the best thing for me is learn how to learn fast rather than just learning. Um, so yeah, so that's my best advice. Learn how to learn. It's different for everyone. I'm more of a visual person rather than, uh, you know, I just told you all the instructions. Why can't you just get it? I need to see something. Uh, instead of you telling me this is how a thing moves, I want to see how, you know, it was done to get it to move. And so for me, learning that I, that I am a visual learner helped me a lot. Absolutely, I agree. Just knowing what your learning style is and never right. stop learning. Those are things that everyone has to do in some form or fashion at some point. And the learning style, that definitely saved me in my grad program. <laughs> Especially if you're going to graduate school and you get your PhD, people will expect that you know everything whether if it's you know your field or not. If you have a doctor in front of it, they expect you to know everything. Absolutely, I, that's one of the uh, fun parts of it. Of course, then hopefully you do know many things and just you know that like trivia piece where you can be like, I know this randomly. <laughs> right. Well, thank you both for helping out and uh, having a great conversation about research and senior design projects and everything that's kind of going on um, for our Ask an Ambassador. At this point, you should see on the contact information on the screen. My name is Karen McAllister. I'm the Assistant Director of Student Recruitment. And we also have our engineering ambassadors. Estrada is one of our engineering ambassadors. And you can actually talk to our engineering ambassadors via email or during their office hours. So that information is available there. So you can always ask them further questions or ask them a little bit more about their experience because they are all current engineering students. So I want to thank you all for joining us for another Ask an Ambassador and we will see you next week. Have awesome. a good one. Bye. Thank you. Have a good day.